On May 8, 1829, Ludwig Böhm writes a letter to King Ludwig I of Bavaria. In this well-known letter, Böhm requests a privilege, or a protected patent, for a new flute that he has invented. His new flute, he says, surpasses all known flutes at home and abroad in terms of purity and of intonation, equality of tone, and ease of handling, as well as beautiful shapes and pure, solid workmanship. For me, as a flute maker copying 18th and 19th century originals, uh, I'm fascinated with this model, and I wanted to learn more about, about it. What was so special about this model? And why is it so perfect in so many ways? I've been interested in copying a co uh, one of those instruments and was particularly inspired to do so after hearing Rachel Brown play on one of these originals in a recent flute conference. Um, although a lot have been written about Böhm's life after the introduction of this 1832 model um, with its iconic system that would later lead to the modern flute as we know it today, relatively little has been written about Böhm's earlier career. It's often forgotten that prior to his 1832 invention, Böhm has had a 20-year career as a successful flute virtuoso playing on simple system flutes. Furthermore, because Böhm's name is so strongly associated with the invention of the modern cylindrical flute, I believe the historical flute world, both makers and players, have shied away from making copies of these simple system flutes and playing them. The goal of this paper is to have a closer look at Böhm's simple system flutes and shed more light about their special features and their dating. I would also like to consider Böhm's aesthetic as a musician and a performer as it reflects in these flutes, as well as their historical significance. Böhm's biography is relatively well known, but I'd like to have a quick look at the beginning of his career and especially into his flute making activity. Born in Munich in 1794, son of goldsmith Karl Friedrich Böhm, Ludwig Böhm has shown an early talent as a goldsmith and a jeweler in his father's shop, and by the age of 14 he is given considerable responsibilities in the shop. He starts playing the flute at the age of 16. Two years later, in 1812, he is appointed first flutist of the first of the new court, Royal Court Theatre. Between 1812 and 1817, he spends his days working in his father's shop, and in the evening he plays in the orchestra. Böhm counts these among the happiest days of his life. King Maximilian jo Joseph of Bavaria hears him in the theater and demands that he plays a solo every time the king is present. In 1818, he is appointed court musician, a prestigious position that will hold for, he, he will hold for 30 years to come. At that time, he begins to tour both as a goldsmith as well as a flute virtuoso. Over the next decade, his career as a flutist takes off and he tours Switzerland, North Germany, and Vienna publishes his first compositions and organizes concerts back in Munich. In 1820, at the age of 26, Böhm marries Anna Rohleitner and, have, and the two have their first children, Maria, Ludwig, Karl, Theobald, and Max. Not a lot is known about Böhm's activities in making flutes before 1828. Most of the information we have comes from a, one paragraph in his 1847 treatise of, on the construction of flutes. Baum's biographer and lifelong friend Karl von Schaffbeutel adds a few more um, details in his 1888 essay on Baum's life. Here is what Baum tells us from in his 1847 treatise. In the years between 1812 and 1817, by using facilities of my goldsmith shop, which had the usual equipment and which was further supplied with the necessary machinery, I made many flutes for myself and for others according to the best models of the time, and also with my own ideas, um, several of which are still in use 35 years later, such as new types of springs, pads for the keys, cork line tenons, a movable golden embouchure, and others. After I obtained my appointment to the Royal Court Chapel in 1818, the business of goldsmithing was given up, and I devoted myself entirely to music. For some years, because of the lack of my own shop, I had flutes made according to my designs by other makers. However, the instruments thus obtained were not satisfactory, and finally, in order to carry out my own ideas about, without hindrance, I decided to establish my own flute factory. It's not clear from Böhm's description how official uh, these flute-making activities were. Uh, was he signing his instruments? Um, usually, flute makers in Munich needed to have a special permit uh, a license to pay for a special license in order to sell their flutes. Um, 
which Bohm as a goldsmith could not obtain. Furthermore, who were these makers that Bohm mentioned? Uh, Karl Wenzke uh, proposes several um, woodwind makers active in Munich at the time, including Ustas Schoeffel, Stiegler, Windmissinger, and Hess. Surviving flutes by these makers certainly show a lot of resemblance to Bohm's work, but it is unclear which one of them actually worked for Bohm and whether Bohm's flutes were made within a general Munich, pre existing Munich school of flute making. Um, or it could be that these other makers were just simply making flutes um, that Bohm made after they were more well known. The flutist Karl August Grenzer mentions Kame Musicus Bohm in München in an 1824 Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung article. He lists Böhm among a list of contemporary makers whose flutes he tried. The list includes the best maker of the time, Grenzer, Grisling and Schott, Koch, Sachs, Meltzer and Holzapfel. It's not clear from the contents whether Böhm already had a reputation for his flutes by that time, or that Grenzer simply just played on one of the instruments. It's clear that by 1828, Böhm has plans to get more serious about manufacturing flutes. Schaffhoetl adds that although Böhm's position as a court musician was prestigious, the income it provided him, which was 700 florins in 1822, was not enough to support him and his growing family, and he therefore decides to open a flute workshop. In the beginning of the year, he travels to Vienna to procure, to procure wood for his new factory, as Schaffhoetl tells us. He continues the tour north to Italy and only gets back to Newark in Munich in August 1828. Here is what Böhm writes. In October 1828, I was again at work in my well-equipped shop and began to construct various machines and appliances for making with more facility and accuracy a better key mechanism than had previously been in use. Among these devices was one for screwing the metal posts into, woods, into, the, into the wood accurately in the line of radius of the bore. Another was for boring the holes in the spherical heads of the pillars. These and numerous other devices secured the easy and precise operation of parts of the mechanism. By the end of the year, the first flute was finished, having a new key mechanism which was both solid and elegant in construction. The flute was met with general approbation as to quality of tone and intonation and was wild, widely adopted. In the year 1831, I played in Paris and in London upon such a flute of the ordinary system, which had been made in my workshop in Munich. Even after his workshop is established, Böhm is still not able to sell flutes under his own name. He is not a woodwind maker by trade, and so cannot apply for a concession or a license to make woodwind instruments. Instead, in May 8, 1829, he writes to King Ludwig I of Bavaria, asking for a privilege or a trade patent, protecting his new invention with a permit to make flutes for the next 10 years. In his position, presenting his flutes as a completely new invention was the only way he could get a legal permit to operate his flute factory. In his letter, letter to the king, Böhm writes, After many attempts, I have now managed to produce flutes which surpass all known flutes at home and abroad in terms of purity of intonation, equality of tone, and facility of operation, as well as beautiful and elegant design and thoroughly neat and solid workmanship. What exactly was this new flute? In figure two of his 1847 treatise, Böhm depicts the flutes assigned with the description TH Böhm 1829. This engraving is reprinted in Schaffhoetl's biography about 60 years later. Schaffhoetl repeats the same information given by Böhm and adds some details, emphasizing that the main improvement of this model was the use of pillar-mounted keys instead of block-mounted ones as was previously done. Bohm was certainly not the first one to use mounted pillars for his key work. Pillars have been used on French flutes by Laurent and Godefroy from early in the century. However, on Bohm's new model, the pillars were directly mounted into the wood instead of soldering them to metal plates that were later screwed in the wood, like on contemporary French flutes. This model also sees the first use of long axle parallel to the flute for the, for the use of the double B flat patch. This was later developed in his 1832 ring system and eventually becomes the standard way used to mounting keys on um, woodwinds in, uh, um, to this day. Here we have um, an example of um, 1821 Laurent flute, and you can see how the, um, the mounting of the key with pillars is very similar to what Böhm uses, only we have 
the, the plates under the pillars. Uh, and another interesting detail is that the C foot on these instruments, the arrangement of the key is extremely similar to what Böhm uses uh, with the side, sideways um, flaps. And so I think he was very much inspired by Laurent's flute. Which, and Laurent was probably one of the first ones to uh, use uh, pillars for mounting keys. And as you see, uh, Böhm definitely used a lot of these ideas. His privilege is approved on May 27th, 1829. And finally, Böhm can produce flutes under his own name. He hires Rudolf Greve, son of Mannheim woodwind maker Andreas Greve, to be the foreman in his shop. Schaffhäutel describes Greve as Böhm's best and most excellent workman. He also employs his brother, Jakob, as a second assistant. In November 1830, Böhm writes again to King Ludwig I requesting an advance of 2,000 florins from the industrial fund for the purpose of flute manufacturing. He, he describes the success of his new flutes, having sold 65 flutes worth 3,600 florins, which I have sold so far, 21 pieces have sold abroad. He is further hoping to be able to employ not just two assistants as at present, but eight or 10 alongside me and provide them with a salary. I think it's incredible to think that over a period of 18 months, uh, Bohm's workshop produced so many flutes. It's an average of one a week, uh, certainly faster than I can produce them. Um, Bohm continues his touring and travels to Paris, in Lo uh, London, and Paris and London. Well, Greve manages the flute factory in his absence. In London, he performs his new, on his new model and meets Nicholson, a meeting that a very famous meeting that leads to the development of his new model in 1832. Between 1833 and 1838, Böhm is traveling and is no longer, um, no longer has time to manage his flute factory. Eventually, the privilege is sold to Rudolf Greve, who keeps making flutes under the name Böhm and Greve. Greve continues to manage the shop until, after a legal fight, the partnership breaks and the two go their separate ways. In, this is in 1845. And anecdotally, they still stay neighbors because they live on the same building um, in Munich. Uh, Böhm lives on the second floor and uh, Greve lives on the third floor. And they still live as neighbors for a couple more years after the, their partnership breaks. We can get a pretty good idea of what kind of flutes were available uh, from the workshop of Böhm and Greve from a price list that dates from around 1839. Um, the price list is divided into two. We have um, flutes of new construction, which are the 1832 um, ring key system. And we have flutes of ordinary construction, which are simple system flutes. Um, I'd like to look into uh, the exact models that they offer and see if we can match them up with some surviving instruments. Um, this is the second page. Get rid of me. There we go. So the, for the simple system flutes, um, the fanciest, uh, most uh, expensive flutes, and that's number one, um, is offered in cocos or ebony with a tuning slide, rings, seven keys, and three levers in silver with gold springs, screwed in key cups, and this is offered in cocos wood or in boxwood. So I'd like to talk for a second about the um, um, terms that Bum uses or that are used in the price list. Um, the key levers or hebels, um, we have three on the flute. Um, the first one is the double F, and on uh, Bum's flutes, it's really interesting. The actual key is the long F, and the lever is the short F. So the short F is operating, uh, opening the, the long F. Um, the second lever is the double B flat. That's um, found down here, and it's mounted on a long axle. And the third lever has been a bit of a mystery for uh, some time, and uh, I'm really grateful for Peter Spohr and for Robert Biggio for uh, pointing me out in the right direction. Um, this third lever, uh, I think there are only one or two surviving instruments with that third lever, because um, it was taken off in some cases. And it's basically an extension of the B flat, double B flat axle. Um, and it's basically an extra key 
that operates, opens and closes the long, the, um, the C key. So the second term that uh, is mentioned is the Klappenfutteringen aufgeschraubt. And um, as far as I understand this, um, these are uh, lined keypads um, and screwed in lined keypads. And those are found on, some, on quite a few originals and certainly on all of the 1832 flutes, and they're also listed in the price list, uh, those screwed in keypads. So this system would have been the most expensive and that would cost you 88 florins. Here we have another example of one of those flutes, and I'm grateful for Robert, to Robert Bija for sharing this image with me. Um, this is a beautiful boxwood flute um, with a fancy screwed in cups and three levers, as you can see, um, the long F uh, with a short left lever, um, double B flat, and the C lever. Moving along in the list, we have uh, number two, flute in caucus or ebony, tuning slide, rings, seven keys, and two levers in silver with gold springs. So here we don't have any um, uh, screwed in cups mentioned. So I presume these are just uh, flutes with ordinary uh, round uh, key flaps, like the ones we see in the picture. Um, and this one is quite a bit cheaper. It's only 66 florins. Um, slightly cheaper, uh, you can have the same um, without the gold springs. So Cocos or Ebony rings, uh, seven keys, two levers in silver, slide and springs in brass. Um, available in Cocos or Boxwood. And the cheapest model on the list, number four, and there is quite a big uh, gap in the prices, so this is only 24 florins, um, is in Boxwood, seven keys and two levers, uh, slide in brass, and the keys are in brass as well, uh, ivory, and in ivory rings. Um, I presume this is a block-mounted instrument just because of the big drop in price. It's half the price of the previous instrument. And we have quite a few, a few of these um, cheaper instruments surviving. And you can even go for even cheaper. If you order that instrument with a D-foot joint, it will only cost you 16 florins. So here we have um, a quick overview of what was offered in the, in the price list. Um, at the top, we have the most expensive 1832 model, uh, which would cost you uh, 132 florins. Uh, under that, we have, um, if you wanted a s still the simple system instrument, but with the latest improvements and fanciest key mechanism, um, that will cost you 88 florins. Um, if you were just going for a pillar-mounted regular key, it will be five, 55 florins. And if you were a real poor musician and you couldn't afford uh, those instruments, you could still buy uh, a boxwood instrument with um, uh, block-mounted keys and that would cost you between 16 or 24 uh, florins. And I find the differences in prices are quite uh, extraordinary. Um, the, the most expensive flute would cost uh, almost, I don't know, like eight times more than the, mo the cheapest one. Um, and if we compare it, for instance, to Böhm's salary, we know he earned 700 florins as a year as a court musician. Um, so um, the most expensive flute would cost him about an equivalent of two months of work, and the cheapest one would be just a couple of days. So it's a big difference. Um, and I think they probably had, uh, they had a market probably for, for cheap instruments as well, not for the, for the, for the most, the fanciest uh, instruments. And definitely we see quite a few of those simple block-mounted instruments uh, surviving. Next, I'd like to look at some of the details found on um, simple system flutes. So let's start with the stamps. We have uh, three stamps that we find. Uh, the first and probably the earliest one is um, T. Böhm München. Um, the next is um, T. H. Böhm à Munich. So it's a French version of the first stamp. Uh, and the last stamp that probably dates from the time of uh, Böhm and Grave's partnership is Böhm and Greve à Munich. So the first stamp uh, is only found on five flutes in total, 
uh, four of them block mounted and one single one that's pillar mounted. Uh, these flutes uh, seem a little bit different compared to the flutes with the other two signatures. Uh, the turning is a little bit different. They're, they're a little bit thinner. And to my eye, they look um, like they've been made by a, a different hand than the other ones. Um, so we don't really know uh, when this stamp, stamp dates from, but um, this is the only stamp where we don't have any 1832 flutes. So perhaps this is an early stamp where before he even invented that system. Um, one scenario I can see is that maybe this is, a, this is the stamp he used when he was still working alone in the workshop before he engaged, uh, before he um, hired Grave and the later instruments were turned by Grave. This, and these instruments maybe have been turned by Boehm, but we really have no way to, t to know um, so far. Um, so for the second, here are a couple of examples for the second, uh, TH Boehm uh, Munich. Uh, we have quite a few instruments with that stamp, uh, 28 flutes, uh, block mounted, pillar mounted, and the majority of them actually ring key flutes. And this is probably 1829 to 1839. Um, maybe the French version is because uh, this was on instruments that went for export. So after he actually got his privilege, he could export the flutes and maybe he changed the stamp to a more Frenchified, uh, fancier Frenchified version. And finally, a couple examples for flutes by Böhm and Greve. And we have 21 flutes with a stamp, uh, again, block and pillar mounted, as well as ring key system flutes. Next, let's look at the bore on these instruments. Um, so I've compiled on this graph bores from several flutes, both with earlier uh, stamps, as well as uh, the later ones, so the T Böhm, TH Böhm, Berm and Grave. Uh, these are all, uh, most of them are uh, three part instruments. Uh, you can see the middle section here. Uh, that's the middle joint, uh, the, the, the body of the flute, and then the foot joint here. Um, the head joints on all these instruments are not on the graph, but they're all 18.4, as Berm actually writes in his treatise. Um, and what I find remarkable about this bore graph is that um, the bores are pretty straight. They're really, um, quite uh, rationalized, I would say, um, from 18.2 on the middle joint to 12, um, and really, really, really straight. And all these flutes look like they probably will ream with the same reamers, or at least with the same intention in mind for, for, the, for, the, for the conicity of the flute. Um, even if we compare, here's uh, the bore, I'm adding a bore of uh, 1832, model flute, again, the middle, the body of the flute is exactly the same as the simple system instruments. Uh, the only difference we get is sometimes in some in the foot joints on this flute, uh, it flares out. Um, and also there is some variety in the simple system flutes where sometimes um, the bore continues to, 18, to uh, 10 millimeters um, taper down or just stays straight at the end of the foot joint uh, around 10.5. Uh, Next, let's look at the embouchures on these instruments. Um, the majority of simple system flutes have an oval embouchure, and there are some varieties in the size. Um, we can see that the later instruments tend to have slightly bigger um, embouchures, which are still oval. And um, the way they compensated for the fact that the embouchure was bigger by, was by adding a bit more wall thickness. So you can see here, uh, um, Berm and Graver flute on the right, has a um, slightly bigger, slightly thicker head joint um, than the one compared to it, which is the table berm. The embouchure on berm's 1832 model is drastically different. It is larger with a completely different shape, a parallelogram instead of an oval. Additionally, the back is hollowed out, making the angle at the blowing edge sharper. As Berm tells us in his pamphlet, The New Constructed Flute, around 1834, this shape of embouchure helps concentrate the airstream. Additionally, if you have any problem with the hissing sound, it can easily be avoided after a short practice. So the hissing sound comes from the fact that it's a bigger embouchure, uh, it's a longer blowing, um, like it's, a, it's, it's basically longer blowing uh, air, of, of your airstream, so you have to get used to, um, 
to uh, a different, slightly different kind of blowing. Um, so this kind of uh, embouchure is one of the um, features on uh, BAM's new model with its greater preference, with its preference for greater dynamic range, which was one of BAM's main goal with this model. It is therefore surprising to find this exact shape of embouchure on his simple system flutes. So here we have an example of this kind of embouchure um, on two simple system flutes, uh, one by Bohm and Grave and one by Turbo Bohm, um, with an, a rectangular embouchure with a hollowed out back. And if you look closer, you can really see um, the, the rectangle and the hollowed out back. I found also a, a sort of hybrid um, embouchure with an oval shape and still a hollowed out back on a grave flute um, a little bit later. So it's interesting to see, to see how on a, basically on a simple system flute, BEM, uh, BEM and BEM and grave felt that they could just put some of the features of the newer flutes. And um, what this embouchure does, and I've experimented a little bit with this kind of shape, is that it makes the flute sound very, very modern, a lot louder. Of course, your fork fingerings are completely, almost completely gone because it's a much bigger embouchure. Um, and I think if you put side by side um, an 1832 flute and a simple system flute with a, mod with a more modern embouchure, they will sound almost the same. Many of the surviving flutes have brass or silver tuning slides. The head joints are partially lined in the manner of French flutes, as opposed to fully lined as found on German, Viennese, and some English flutes. The upper tube is made out of three parts connected together, soldered together, and uh, a flange or a silver disc that sits against the head joint. Um, the whole thing screws into the wood part of the head joints. And um, the screw part is made in a different metal, uh, possibly pewter. So here is uh, what it looks like from the inside. Uh, you can see the two tubes, uh, the flange, and the metal part. Uh, Baum writes in his 1834 pamphlet that he found that the tuning slide disturbing to the vibrations of the flute, and that the metal produced to his ears a harsh, disagreeable tone. Maybe the added weight was meant to improve the transition between the wood and the metal on these flutes. Uh, in any case, I still have no idea. This is one of the details on Bem's flute that I still don't know how it was done, how he could connect these four parts and solder them together uh, without the whole thing falling apart, and also why he needed to do it in such a complicated manner. It's not really clear. Um, a couple of details for the keywork. I mean, we've seen some of the keywork earlier. Um, an interesting detail we can find on the foot joint of these instruments. Um, on the top left, you see um, 1829, uh, probably earlier stamp, um, that has two axles for the low key, for the C sharp and the C. Um, and later on, uh, these became with one axle for both keys, slightly different arrangement. Now, what's interesting to see is that the same arrangement is found on the 1832 system. So I think probably once the 1832 system was introduced with this kind of system, they switched over um, to the same arrangement on the simple system flutes or the other way around. Uh, but in any case, the two shared a very similar system. We're lucky enough to have two original fingering charts from Bohm's workshop. They're virtually identical as far as the fingerings are concerned. But as we can see, the one on the left is from uh, Telmo Bohm, and the one on the right is Bohm and Grave. And on, basically, they used the same uh, fingering chart, the same engraving, uh, but uh, erased Bohm's name and added Grave's name to the flute itself. So that's how they adjusted it. So let's look more closely at um, some of the details here. Um, we have... Um, First fingering that's kind of uh, striking is the finger of the E natural uh, in both octaves, and that's meant to be played with the E flat key open. Um, this is something that's typically found on Viennese and German flutes, uh, flutes by Liebel, flutes by Koch, um, have this system where you tune the E a little bit too flat uh, in order to overcome the fact that this is the smallest hole on the flute and it's the softest hole and uh, softest note on the flute. So you tune it too flat and then um, when you open the key, it raises the pitch, but also makes it a little bit louder. 
Uh, another interesting fingering, uh, again, typical German Viennese, uh, is the middle, is the, the second of FC, um, which is fingered two, four, five, six, seven. Um, and that's basically like a third octave C down the octave. Um, and this is a very strong C natural, much stronger than the regular uh, Baroque, Baroque fingering, fourth fingering. Um, and this, again, something that you find very often on Viennese flutes. Um, and finally, another interesting fingering is for this high C sharp. It's fingered uh, like a D with an extra finger. So it's a very high C sharp. And on French methods, we find it as a note sensible. And it's interesting to see that um, this is the main fingering that Ben gives for his high C sharp. There are numerous descriptions of Bum's playing from before 1832. Many of them praise his tender singing style of playing. For example, after his concert with Molink in Nuremberg in December of 1823, the critic writes, the characteristic of his playing is a soft development of mild elegiac sentiment, a beautiful romantic longing. His singing on his instruments springs from a profoundly sensitive breast. He is distinguished by the way he expresses the shading and the nuances and the sweet melancholy of his charming style, which gives him place among the foremost flutists of Europe. One fears to breathe, lest the beautiful blending of the tone, the spell of his music, should be interrupted. Um, and another one from Leipzig later in 1824, um, the critic writes, her Böhm's playing is solid, that is to say pure and clever, with a beautiful, soft, yet full tone. We also know that Böhm was heavily influenced by Italian singing, and Schaffhäutl described how Böhm studied with an Italian singer. Schaffhäutl says, the peculiarity of Böhm, one which he stands unsurpassed, was the charm, the soul of his phrasing. Böhm started singing with an, excellent, with an excellent Italian singer. He would sometimes practice for days the interpretation of a musical phrase, until his maestro would say, well, that is singing. His earlier simple system flutes certainly bring to mind that kind of interpretation. They are not constructed for volume, but for control and shaping of sound. The voicing on his flute resembled French flutes of the time, with their oval embouchure and relatively sharp blowing edges, which gives a precise, sweet sound. Bum's famous meeting with Nicholson was to change that. And with his 1832 model, Bum changed his approach, approach to voicing completely. The new parallelogram-shaped embouchure with its sunken back, backside and sharpened blowing edge, as well as larger finger holes, gave preference to volume and bigger dynamic range over sweetness of tone. It's interesting to see that uh, simple system flutes that were made in Bum's factory later in the 30s and the 40s also have a little bit of that tendency uh, with slightly bigger embouchure and slightly bigger finger holes. In conclusion, it's fascinating to see how the line between simple system flutes and the new 1832 system flutes was quite thin, uh, with some of the later simple system flutes sharing some of the new innovation introduced in the 1832 system, like embouchure shape, screwed in keycaps, and the way the low keys were mounted. The two models share a very similar bore, and the same rimmers could have actually been used in Bum's workshop to produce the two models. It's clear from Bum's writing that he was less concerned with the shape of the, that tube, so the body of the flute, the bore, and the wall thickness, but that the fingering systems, hole size, and placement was much more important to him. We can talk about French, English, Viennese, or German school of flute making. However, Bum's simple system flutes represent a mix of national style, French voicing, German keywork, Viennese, and German fingerings. More than representing a national style of making, these flutes reflect Bum's ideas and aesthetic as a virtuoso musician. As such, they would be appropriate to use in any kind of repertoire uh, from the first half of the 19th century and would work well as solo, chamber, or orchestral instruments. For me, as a flute maker, this has been a fascinating journey. Trying to copy Bum's flute and keywork meant stepping up a league from my everyday Naust and Grenzer. Uh, I had to figure out new ways to make keys uh, in a systematic and precise manner, uh, make new types of embouchures and tuning slides. It has been an absolute inspiration to follow Bum's footsteps and to do so. And I'm still not even attempting to make any of the fancier model offered by the workshop. 
I hope I can convince other makers and players to explore this fascinating uh, and inspiring model. And before I sign off, I'd like to thank um, all of the people that helped me along with this research, um, museums, uh, private collections, individuals, uh, but give a special mention in particular to Peter Spohr uh, for his patience and for endless exchange of emails and information and photos. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. And also for Ludwig Böhm, if he's there, um, for publishing every piece of paper um, Theobald Böhm's is fined on and making it available to us. It was very, very handy to have all of that. And finally, uh, to Mark Leone for um, his hospitality and for his generosity. And to all of you for uh, bearing with me. Um, thank you very much.